you know, way higher than 89 in my book. I think he is one of the best worship pastors I've ever seen. And of course, I love Ricky. And I love the discipleship strategy that you have at your church, planted, rooted, growing, and then going. And so Ricky's asked me, here's what he said. He goes, Kenton, please get everyone to understand how important small groups are in the discipleship process. So that's my job. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about that. And here's why. Ricky gave me this statistic. You know, for six months out of the year, you know, the good months, anybody can live in the desert, right? They come from all over everywhere. You know, they, they love it. But in the summer, you know, those six months, you got to be tough to live here, right? And here's what Ricky said. I don't know where he got the statistic. 78% of the people who are not connected in small groups die spiritually in the summer in the Coachella Valley. It's that tough. It's what Ricky said. I wouldn't say that. Ricky said that. So my job is to get you connected into a small group. You pretty motivated? Woo, the excitement. Yeah, okay. Not so much. So we'll try to go to God's word and get that done for you. So it was a wonderful time. Years ago in my life, I was dating uh, Lori, who would become my wife. I was finishing graduate school. I started my job as a pastor. I was playing uh, sand volleyball with some guys I played volleyball with in college. I had a Hobie cat in the bay at Newport. My life was full of all sorts of things. And I remember I met with Lori uh, one time, and we met at a coffee shop, and we were talking. And I was talking about how full my life was, and she was smiling at me, and she looked absolutely gorgeous. I remember just being lost in her eyes and thinking, this is the most beautiful woman, just amazed, and she smiled at me, and then I, I didn't see it coming, should have seen it coming, um, but she said, some things just changed my life, she said, you know, Kent, I love that your life is so full. I mean, there's all sorts of good things, and you can have all of those things in your life. And then she looked at me, and she goes, but you can't have all of this and all of that. If you want all of this, you're gonna have to make our relationship a priority. And I said, what do you mean? You know, do I have to quit playing volleyball with my friends? Do I have to sell my sailboat? Do I gotta stop graduate school? I mean, what does it mean? What are you talking about? And she said, I don't know what it means. I mean, you're gonna, you just have to reprioritize some things in our relationship first. You probably will have to sell that boat and go buy a ring, but you decide, you decide. <laughs> and she said, I would never try to force you to love me. I couldn't force you to love me. But <laughs> she smiled at me and said, if you want all of this, if you want the thrill of my presence in your life and experience life together, if you want to be inspired by my love for you, if you want to experience the fun, the joy, the adventure of a life together, if you want your life transformed by all of my love in your life, I'll make you a better person, then you're gonna have to make our relationship a priority. I'm sitting there, my head is spinning, and then she smiles at me and says, she goes, and just so you know, there's other guys that are interested in all of this, <laughs> and they would love to put me first, but you decide. And then she stood up, and she walked away, and her hair was swishing, and her hips were swishing, and just as she walked to the door, she got there, she turned back at me and smiled, and then she walked away. And I was sitting, I was 23 years old, and I had questions. I mean, there were things that I'm trying to figure out. I go, what's it going to look like, you know, to do this? I mean, you know, what's it going to mean? You know, if I all of a sudden change my career, you know, I'm not playing volleyball, would I be happy doing that? If I sell this boat, am I going to be happy with this? I had all sorts of questions. You know, what's it, what does it mean to marry? And is she the right person and all those things? I have questions just like you had questions. Is there any way I could get all of my questions answered? All of you that are married, did you have all your questions answered? No, no one gets all their questions answered. There's no way you can get all those questions answered. But there was one thing that I knew, and it was this, that I wanted Lori in my life. I didn't want to miss out life on her, and I wanted to make her a top priority, and I knew how to make Lori a priority. I had to change the way I spent my 
See, you all know. So don't pretend you don't know as we go through this message. I had to change the way I spent my time, and I had changed the way we, I spent my money. Yeah, see, you're good. The rest of them are like, I don't want to talk about money in church. But I had to spend the way I spent my time. I had to, instead of doing all of these things in my life, I had to make Lori a priority, put her in my schedule first, and see what else fits in. And then I had to go sell that boat. And I'll tell you, when I sold that boat, there was something that shifted in me that was powerful because it was like selfishness and self-centered kind of moved away. And I took my first step at what it meant to be a husband. And it was good for me. And when I decided it, it wasn't a chore. It wasn't an obligation. I wasn't going, I hate this and I don't like this. I was excited to do it because I loved Lori. And just like you, I made the decision, oh, it gets better. I made that decision to make her a priority, and I never, I never missed after that. It was one and done, just like you, right? I never let my work get out of priority or my friends get out of priority or all of a sudden, you know, things I wanted to do. Lori was all first, always first priority, just like you. <laughs> no, of course I messed it up. And so what did I need to do? I needed to redecide, reprioritize. What the Bible talks about is repent. I needed to change. And so, and I did. And sometimes it was just, I would be around Lori and her delightfulness, the wonderfulness. I'm going, I just have to, I mean, I gotta, and I would just put her first. Other times I would spend time, too much time with my career, too much time doing other things. And I thought, why am I doing this? This is crazy. I don't love this. And then there were other times that Lori said what every great spouse says. <laughs> we need to have a talk. And I saw the pain and the sadness in her life of me not having my priorities right. And so I would redecide and I would reprioritize again. And my best life has happened because I made Lori a priority. And we've been partners together in ministry and in parenting, and in life, and the adventure of life, and I've had the best life because I made her a priority, and I am the best me. Without Lori, I would have been a selfish person and self-centered. I would have lived a small, tiny life. I mean, I wouldn't have the life I did. I wouldn't have been, you know, she has a great passion for poor and needy and missions. Those parts wouldn't have even been a part of my life, and so I lived my best life as a result of that. Today, you're in church, you're in the right place. And I love it because we're gonna talk about what does it mean to make Jesus the priority in your life and in doing that, specifically how to do that and why small groups are such an important part of that. But I love it because if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a believer, you're gonna get a chance to rethink, reprioritize, redecide again and say, that's right, this is who I wanna be. And for those of you that are seekers, maybe you're trying to figure out spiritually where you are, you will hear from Jesus as clear, because Jesus says it, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Is that exciting? Oh my God, the excitement builds. I know, I know, you're just going crazy with excitement. Okay, so here it is. I'm gonna read for you. If you have a Bible, you can turn to it. It'll be on the screen. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. These are the words of Jesus. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp that is provided light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is the darkness? This is the verse that's probably most familiar to you. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. <clears throat> you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Here in this passage, Jesus says, just as clearly as Lori said to me, you can have all of that. You can have all of the possessions that you want, the pleasures of this life. You can have the stuff and things, golf, fun, just the stuff. You can have all of that. Or you can have all of him. 
You can experience the thrill of his grace, the wonder of his love for you, the, his presence in your life. You can be inspired by God's belief in you. You can experience his protection, his provision, his guidance, his forgiveness. You can be transformed by his power and the Holy Spirit. But to have all of that, you've got to put God first He's got to be the priority in your life. And then Jesus's invitation is just, that's it. And immediately, you know, we have questions. We go, you know, Jesus would never force us to love him. So what does it mean to put God first? I mean, all of a sudden, do I not get to play golf? Do I not get to do the things that I enjoy in life? Is he gonna mess around with my relationships? I mean, is it gonna change how, you know, what 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 is it gonna mean? And you know what, you're, are you gonna get all your questions answered? Do you remember where we did that before? The answer was no. Are you going to get all your questions answered? No. no, you'll never have your questions answered before you're following Jesus. But we know how to make God a priority, just like you did. You have to change the way you spend your... Come on, play with... Are we not talking? Change the way we spend our time. And this one, I know it's hard for you to say. In the way that you spend your money. Okay, that's... Just as simple as that. And so it's how we do this. And when we decide this, for those of us who have decided to put God first, it wasn't an obligation. We didn't go, I hate this and my life is miserable. Now. We loved it because we were created to do that. And so God is first place in our life. And just like every other decision we make, we, it's not one and done. Of course we struggle with it. I mean, other things take, you know, we get them out of priority. Our jobs take too much time. Or all of a sudden we start to pursue other things and we get our life out of whack and our priorities get out of whack. And so we have to decide again, redecide and reprioritize. But for those of us who did it, we understood our best life happens when we make God the number one priority and we become the best person when God is the number one priority in our life. That's what Jesus says. Now, I'm gonna go through this passage again and we're gonna look at it because all that Jesus does is say the same thing three times. Why does he say it three times? Because when you repeat something three times, it really punches, hey, hey, hey! See, you got that. See how the third one kind of got your attention? See, the first one, not so much, but third time, you get it. So Jesus is getting your attention and he's going, hey, 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 you know, so that you get it. All right. So we're going to go through it three times. It's the same thing three times. I'm going to read this just to give you a heads up. And there's a quiz. The answers are right in the passage. You can't miss if you just pay attention. All right. So Matthew 6 19, the first time he says it, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Jesus first says, it's real simple, he says don't store up earthly treasure. And the first reason he says is because... Good, A for you. Moss, rust, destroy. Why would you invest your whole life in something that can deteriorate? I said that word, right? And depreciate, all right? Why would you do that? That would be full. The second reason, he says, is don't invest in earthly treasure is because it can be, good job here, stolen. So it could be stolen. So why would you invest your whole life in something a thief can take, uh, A pandemic can take it away from you. Inflation can take it away from you. A recession would take it from you. Why would you invest your whole life in something that can be taken from you? And this is in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7, and the context also is, and why would you invest in things that don't satisfy? Everything in the world, all the pleasures, all the possessions, all the accomplishments, they never satisfy. So don't waste your your one and only life in things that aren't secure, they aren't safe, and they don't satisfy. But then Jesus says, invest your one and only life in treasure that is in heaven. So now what is treasure that's in heaven? It can't be heaven because it's a treasure in heaven. So what is the treasure that's in heaven? Okay, whoever said that gets an A, right? If you don't know what to say in church, you should always go with Jesus. Like the little kid in Sunday school who's going, you know, Sunday school teacher says, 
what's brown and stores acorns for the winter and has a bushy tail? And the little kid says, it sounds like a squirrel, but I'm going with Jesus, all right? So if you don't know it, so what is the one true treasure? Okay, and so Jesus is saying this, and more specifically, his answer would have been your relationship with God. Now, we can only have that relationship with God through Jesus, but so we're gonna say your relationship with God. So what's the one true treasure? Relationship with God. Now, I've got you said that. That means that you understand the thrill of his love. You're inspired by his love in your life. You get to experience his protection, his provision. You're transformed by his love. Now, even though I've told you, and he says, only invest in that treasure because it's safe, it's secure, and it's truly satisfying. Even though I've said it, I guarantee you by tomorrow you mess this up because all Americans do. And so if you think, what is the true treasure in heaven? Instead of saying Jesus or God, this is where your brain is going to disintegrate too. And just watch, this is what happens. You know what having treasure in heaven is? It's building a heavenly, this is all wrong. Okay, this is wrong, this is, but this is where your brain goes. It's about building a heavenly portfolio because you can't take it with you but you can send it ahead, which is not a verse in the Bible. And, and so what you do is I'm gonna be a giver and God loves givers. And when I'm doing that, I am making an investment in my heavenly portfolio. I'm building you know, ahead and God loves that. God loves good deeds. He loves when we care about the poor. And so I, when I care about the poor, I'm building treasures in heaven. I'm building this heavenly portfolio. And God loves it when we're charactered people. And so when you build good godly character, you're building treasure in heaven. And Jesus loves it when you share the good news of Jesus. And when you do that, you are building a heavenly portfolio because right now our job is to build the house that we're gonna live in in heaven. So you're gonna live in a mansion if you build with godly character, right? No, that's not right. You are not building your house because who's building a house in heaven for you? Jesus is, you are not. But the reason Americans love that thought of, no, I'm building a portfolio, is because we live in America and we're going, yeah, that's right, and we're good. But if you lived in the two-thirds world where you're just crushed with oppression, or if you are a Ukrainian believer right now, you would not think, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, let's go on, you're doing it. Because while we're saved by grace, we think it's something that we do, but that's not treasure in heaven. The one treasure in heaven is? Jesus. That's right. And so what you're thinking when you think you're building a heavenly portfolio, here's your thinking. You are like the stupid husband who marries his wife, has kids, and says, every pay period, the way I show my love for you is I deposit a bunch of money in the bank, and I'm sorry I can't go to the kids' games, and I can't go to back to school nights, and I don't have any time to date you, but I'm depositing money in the bank, and I'm building a portfolio because I love you. And all the women go, Idiot, right? You say it, right? You go, because that's not love at all. But yet we treat God that way. No, that's what I'm doing. I'm building a heavenly portfolio because I love God so much that he's not loving God. Building a heavenly portfolio is loving God and investing in your relationship with God because he's your true treasure. And when God is your true treasure, yes, you're generous. And yes, you, you, know, you love the poor and the needy and less because you love Jesus, but you're not building a heavenly portfolio. That was exhausting. You got that? Okay, so let's try to remember that. Okay, so Jesus is not saying it's wrong to invest in things or sinful, but what he's saying is where your treasure is. If your treasure is in heaven, where's your heart? These are not complicated questions. In heaven, if your treasure is on earth, where is your heart? So, simple question, where are you spending your time and your money? Where's your treasure? This is what Jesus is asking. And if you're not putting him first, you're losing out because you are not investing in the one treasure that is safe, secure, and is the only thing that is satisfying. Where's your treasure? I know, it's amazing. This, whoever over there is brilliant, okay? There are, so now, secondly, he's going to say the same thing a second time. Same deal, just a different way. How do you do that? How do you make Jesus your treasure? Look at this. For your eye is the lamp, like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light in you uh, that you think you have is darkness, how deep is the darkness? It's simple as this. If your eye is healthy, 
you're looking towards heaven and you're full of light. If your eye, if your treasure, if you're looking at this world, your eye is filled with darkness. And you experience this all the time. If your focus is what on this world, on what you want, what you don't have, and what others have, you have filled your life full of darkness. You are envious, you are competitive, you're focused on what you don't have, and it's darkness. Because the principle is this, wherever you look determines your destination. Wherever you look determines your destination. If you're looking up, treasure in heaven. You're looking down, so, and you experience this all the time. I ride mountain bikes with friends. Constantly they're saying, look down, go down, look up, stay up. If you're riding a mountain bike and there's a big rock that's an obstacle and you stare at the rock, what's gonna happen? You're gonna hit it and fall. But if you just keep your eyes up and you don't focus on the obstacle, you stay up. It's amazing. I go skiing. I have four sons. I go skiing. They all want to go out of bounds, double black diamonds through the trees. And you know what they're screaming at me as I'm trying to follow them? Don't look at the trees. Look at a tree, hit a tree. Look between the trees because where you look is where you go. I went to a race car driving school. You know what the first thing they teach you when you're driving a race car? Look where you want to go. You look where you want to go. Don't look where you don't want to go. You look that way, you'll go that way, you'll crash. Look where you want to go. I live at the beach. <laughs> There's a lot of women that are dressed sensually. You know what my wife is saying to me all the time? Hey, 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 right here, Kenton, right here. Eyes, right here, right here, okay? That's it. What is God saying in this passage? Hey, hey, eyes right here, right here. Look at me full of light. Look at the world you're full of darkness. So the question is, where are you looking? Where are you looking? That's simple. And then the third way, as if he said it one more time, it's just this clear, 624. It says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one, love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Look at, I mean, how clear, it says it just like Lori said. You can have all of that. You can have all the things that money buys. You can have fame. You can have the pleasures. You can have the stuff of this world. Have all of that. But he says, but you can't have all of me. You can't experience the thrill of my love and grace inspired by my presence. You can't experience my provision and care. You can't be transformed by my power if you don't make my relationship with you a priority, it's simple as that. And let's just have a moment of honesty. Jesus says in this passage, the greatest, the answer is money, get ready to say it. The greatest threat to your spiritual vitality is money. It's just, it's just money. And we don't like that, but money does it because there is this belief that you know, somehow money will buy us what we want. Look at what it says in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And then look at Matthew 13, 20. This is 22. Listen to what 13, 20 says. It says, 22, the worries of this life and the lure of wealth is uh, so that no fruit is produced. Literally, it chokes out the word of God, it says in verse 20. So look at how dangerous money is. And then Jesus goes on in Matthew 6, and he talks about, you wanna know how you can find out that money is too important to you? One simple way is if you worry. If you worry, it is a signal that you, that money is the wrong place in your life. You're trusting in it. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They don't worry. They're not concerned about where their next meal comes and I take care of them. Why do you worry? And then he summarizes it all, Matthew 6, where he says, you seek the kingdom of God above all else. Just put me first, live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. So Jesus's invitation, I love that, you're geniuses. Jesus's invitation to you for your best life is basically to put him first. And you know how. How do you put God first? You put him first with your time and with your, see how the money one you, I don't wanna talk about money in church. So we're gonna go through time first and then money. So what does it mean to make your relationship with God a priority? 
I, te- I have 11 grandkids, so I teach them how to live a life of priority. So when they come and visit me, I have a list of 21 things that you can do at my house because I am a great grandfather. I mean, I kill it. So here's the 21 things. And on the list, it's like you can go to the zoo. We have a treasure hunt. You can go to the candy store. You can have a hike. You can have, uh, you can have a nanny adventure. That's what she goes by. Or a pause adventure. Uh, we can go to the candy store, the dollar store. There's all these activities, the 21 things. And so I say, what do you want to do today? And so they all list the things that they want to do. Then we prioritize, and the way we prioritize is say I got four grandkids, they've got seven things on their list. I say, okay, you all get two votes of the things that you wanna do, sometimes three, but two, and so they just vote, and what happens is what everybody wants to do most has the most votes, and so they'll go, we wanna go on a treasure hunt, then they wanna go to the zoo, then they wanna do a nanny adventure, and, and the last thing is the candy store. So then what do you do As you look at the day, what's the first thing you put in? The treasure hunt, that was number one. It's not a complicated thing, treasure hunt. So so we go, what's the best time for a treasure hunt? That's always after lunch, so we just put it in. It's not the first thing we do, it's just where it goes in. And then they wanna go to the zoo, you gotta go to the zoo in the morning because it's hot and you can't do it. So then we go to that, and then we do a nanny adventure. So we just put it in the day, right? You all know that, right? So if God's your number one priority, what's the first thing you put in your schedule? Time with God, all right? And so how much time does it take? Okay, I'm gonna tell you, because you don't know, all right? It's a minimum of 15 minutes. So if you're not doing anything, here's what you do. You get the book, Jesus Calling. How many of you have read Jesus Calling? Okay, great. How much does it take to read Jesus' Calling in the verses in a day? Five minutes, exactly. It takes you five minutes, okay? And then after you do that, you pray. And you just pray through ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. How long does it pray talking to God take? 10 minutes, all right? So what's the, the answer is 15. What's the minimum time you can spend every day with God? Why? How do you know it? Because I told you, okay? That's it. That's the answer. You spend less than that, you're not, you don't get up and go, hey, and just, that's not having a conversation. That's not, you need to spend time with God. If you want to do a little bit better, you spend, you know, I spend, you can basically read through the Bible if you read 12 minutes a day of the Bible, write down what you learn, then I journal for 10 minutes, and then I pray for 10 minutes. That's like a half an hour. That's like, you know, I'm a pastor paid. That's really a lot of time, okay? So anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour. Personal time with God. We're clear? But that's only part of it because That's not all to put Jesus first, because to put Jesus first, that means you have to spend time with Jesus, and where do you experience Jesus the best way in the world outside of spending time alone with him? Now, we do that in the word alone with his people, because what is the church literally called? The body of Christ. So when you are with believers, you are with the body of Christ. You are spending time with Jesus. Oh my gosh, this gets so exciting. I know, excitement builds. So you need to connect with God's family. When you become a believer, you're placed into God's family, placed into the body of Christ. God is your father. Jesus is our savior. We are brothers and sisters. And look at what it says in Acts chapter two, these are the activities of what happens when we get together because this is how we experience Jesus. Now, here's the most important phrase in this passage. It says, they experienced a deep sense of awe. So when you are together with God's family doing what Jesus wants you to do, the experience is a deep sense of awe. If you were trying to explain in one word what a, what a deep sense of awe is, what would be the word that you would use? Wow, that's right. When you have a deep sense of awe, it's like, so I want you to say that. You're gonna say it five times with me. You're gonna say, wow, okay? Now watch the wows in this passage. All the believers devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, sharing in meals, prayer, a deep sense of awe. There were miraculous signs and wonders. They met together. They shared their money with those in needs. They worshiped together at the temple large group meetings, and they met in homes, praising God and enjoying the good will of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowships 
those who were being saved. And so what he happens in this passage is there's well. So what happens when the church, when people come together and they, like Ricky, when he teaches God's word and you're together in a large group, what do people do? They go, see the big moment, come on, you gotta join in here. They go, wow, because they see people learning God's word and surrendering themselves to that truth or they're in a small group where they're seeing how God's word applies. People can't help but respond and go, They have fellowship together, which means they're not talking about the latest sports game, but they're talking about life with Jesus and how he's intersecting them. And what does it mean to walk with Jesus? And when people are together talking about their relationship with Jesus, people just respond and they go, when God's people get together, they pray and God answers prayer and there's miraculous and marriages are saved and people and bodies are healed and kids come back from homes and their lives are changed and people can't help but go, Wow, that's right. And they meet in large groups and they meet in small groups and they see people meeting together and they praise God and people come to know Jesus and they're at it every day and people go, wow. And that's what Jesus wants. Oh boy, somebody's excited in here. That's what Jesus wants you to experience. And part of that delivery system is a small group. A small group. There's a large. You're here. I don't need to talk about the large. You're all here. But it's a small group. And here's why. I want you to think of this because I think you might never have thought of this before. You say you love discipleship. How does discipleship happen? The model for discipleship in the New Testament is clearly Jesus. And Jesus got together with a small group of about 12 and he discipled them. But listen, Jesus had all the gifts of the Spirit. He was a walking body of Christ. He was God. You can't be that, okay? But Jesus could. And so Jesus, when he was with the disciples, he had all the gifts of the Spirit, which are he had mercy, he had prayer, faith, he had discernment, wisdom, teaching, leadership, organization, he had encouragement, generosity, kindness, all that. So Jesus could disciple because he had all the gifts of the Spirit, and it only took Jesus. But how, is, how does Jesus show up in the world today? Through the body of Christ. And no one person here has all the gifts, but every one of you has a gift. And so if you get in with a group of like 10 people, you have the gifts of the Spirit, and you will have Jesus discipling you the same way the disciples were discipled. Do you get what I'm saying? So look at what it says in Ephesians 4. Each one of us has a special gift. That's a divine enablement to help people grow. And their responsibility is to equip God's people. Equip means to mend the nets. And so we're all broken, and our lives need to be mended. And so how are our lives mended? It is when we bring our spiritual gift, you bring your spiritual gift, and there's mercy, mercy, encouragement, uh, hospitality, wisdom, discernment, teaching, and those gifts mend the brokenness in our lives so that we equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, and we become mature in the Lord. How do you become mature in the Lord? You get in a small group, you bring your giftedness, and you get to see God work through you. Another person brings their giftedness, and together you disciple each other. You got it? That means if you're not in a small group, what's happening to the small group you should be in? Something's missing, and they'll never have it. Because God's given it to you and you alone, and he's not gonna make up for something that he gave to you, so people are paying a terrible price. And what happens to you? You never get to see God use you to transform and change a person's life. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. And then in Romans 12, 5, we are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. So growing up, first it means that you have to change the way, I mean, to put Jesus first in your life, you've gotta change the way you spend your time. You've gotta be alone with Jesus, and you've gotta be connected in a small group where you're using your giftedness to see others grow, and they're using their giftedness, and together you grow up 
in the Lord. That's what he wants. Is that great? Major theme in the New Testament is giftedness. The second reason you want to be in a small group is the one another's. There are 59 one another's in the New Testament. Look in John 13, 34. It says, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Jesus in the New Testament modeled one another. So there's 59. Listen to some of them. Accept one another. Be kind to one another. Uh, love one another. Forgive one another. Bear with one another's burdens. Pray for one another. Uh, do not judge one another, speak the truth to one another, be hospitable to one another, comfort one another. Can you do any of those here in this large group? No. One another's are all done in small groups. And the way we grow is we one another each other. We accept one another, we pray for one another, we hold each other up during difficulties. We want to love one another. And so, the way we have to change our priority is that we've got to change the way we spend our time. We need to be alone with Jesus, and then we need to be in a small group, and we experience the giftedness of one another's. For 40 years, I have been in a small group, and I'll tell you, and I know it'll sound like a cliche, but I experience God's love, his kindness, the thrill of having a sense that he walks with me. I spend time alone with him, but as in a group, you experience him in a different way. You hear people affirming you. You get exhorted. You get to see God's word through many different eyes. You just experience it together, and you experience God's love. You've got to change the way that you spend your time. The second thing is you've got to change the way you spend. See, you don't want to talk about this one. We're going to talk about it. You've got to change the way you spend Money, what's the number one thing that you have to say about money? Jesus says that he owns everything. That means it's not yours. So you have to say, it's not mine. Now I'm gonna ask you to say, it's not mine. It's a crack up, because some of you can't even say this, all right? Just try it, okay? Everybody say it together, it's not mine. <laughs> See, some of you almost gag. You were like, it's <laughs> Because you actually think it's yours and you kind of hold on to it, but it's not yours, it's not yours. And remember what I told you about the boat? When I sold the boat, there was something that shifted in me and I took a step towards becoming a husband because it's like, that's not important. This is way more important. And becoming a giver is a powerful step that God's given us where it gives us the opportunity to make God a priority. I've been a pastor for 40 years. There are four types of people in this room. There are people who give nothing, there's people who give something. There's people who give faithfully, kind of regularly, some kind of percentage. Then there's people who give generously. Of those four groups, what do you think the largest percentage in churches is? Nothing. The largest, and why? Because it's the hardest step to take. If you're not giving anything, it's really hard to give something. Once you give something, you, you see God's faithfulness, you realize that he's good, and you can trust him. And for some of you, you've never given anything, and you don't know what it means to put God first, because you haven't had that shift that takes place in your life where you go, I'm becoming a different person. And so we've got to be different people. So God told me to ask you one question today. You know, it's the one question he told me to ask you. What do you want? What do you want? You can have all of that. Everything the world, you can have the possessions, the stuff, the things, you can have all of that. Or you can experience the thrill of his grace. Inspired by his love in your life, you can experience his peace and guidance and goodness. You can be transformed by his power. But to have that, you have to put him first. What do you want? What do you want? Listen to this quote, listen to this quote. Every treasure on earth says, give your life to purchase me. Every treasure on earth says, give your life to purchase me. Jesus is the only treasure that says, I gave my life to purchase you. Father, you've spoken to us out of your word. You always do. And you've challenged us. 
and you've brought us to a point where some of us need to decide. We need to redecide. We need to reprioritize. We need to say again to you, we want you first. All of us are broken, all of us stumble, and we fall. And we're used to falling, and sometimes we get so discouraged, we say, oh God, I can't, and I don't wanna promise one more time I'm gonna do something that I won't do. But God, you always meet us with your amazing grace. You always love us. You always accept us where we are, and you give us the power to take the next step. So God, we're gonna just sing for a moment. We're gonna rest. We're gonna let you speak to our hearts. And as we have this moment, would you capture this moment and help us to take the step that we need to take? Let's stand together and let's let Jesus speak to us as we sing. So everyone stand as we worship him together. Great is your faithfulness to I know the number one question that you all have, and it's this, well, how do I get in a small group? You just go online, or you walk down here and you talk to somebody, but you gotta do it. Remember what Ricky said, you try to make it through the summer season alone, 78% of you are gonna die. That's what Ricky says. <laughs> all seriousness, if you have any needs for prayer, there's a team of people that are here down front. You don't wanna go through life alone. If there's something they can, that you're carrying, they'd love to pray with you. Would you hold out your hands and receive God's blessing? Father, look at your children. They love you. Would you bless them and keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up the light of your countenance? Would you turn your attention towards them and when they cry out, would you rescue, heal, and save? And God, would you give them your peace? We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's grace. You have a great day.